I don't know if you've uh, been to Paris before. They've got a tourist attraction there that is a little bit grisly. It's the catacombs of Paris. Unlike the catacombs in Rome, where it shows where the Christians uh, uh, lived and some of the burial areas, but in the catacombs of Paris, they basically had a problem with finding new graves shortly after the French Revolution because, you know, they were just, so many people were butchered with a guillotine. They were just, they couldn't manage all the graves and it became unsanitary. Well, there were all these ancient catacombs under Paris and so they began to stack up the bodies, the remains of six million Parisians in 190 miles of tunnels. And there are about 160,000 tourists that visit Paris every year and they go down into these catacombs and they wind down this spiral staircase and they got tour guides and most of it obviously is blocked off. And they got the one guy that works there and he, um, they said, Don't, doesn't this bother you, all these spirits surrounded by all the ghosts of all these bones? And he said, well, it made me feel a little bit creepy at first, but he says, now the bones kind of fall off and I pick them up and stick them back in. He said, you know, you just get used to it after a while. How'd you like to have that job? But do you really need to worry about walking through a cemetery and the people spooking you? I heard one time this, you know, people put some interesting things on their tombstones. And it's an education to walk through a cemetery. And this one man... Uh, he put on his tombstone, stop my friend as you go by, as I am now, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, you soon shall be, so prepare yourself to follow me. <laughs> well, the schoolboy was walking through the cemetery and he stopped and he looked at that writing on the tombstone and he scribbled with crayon. He said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. <laughs> And that's really the big question. Where do they go? What happens to people when they die? Jesus gives us some encouraging words in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18. He says, I am he that lives. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death, of hell and death. Now the word hell there in the Bible represents the grave. He says, I've got the keys of the grave and death. We don't need to be afraid of death. If you understand this subject, you'll come to find that Christians do not really die. They go to sleep. Let's find out what the Bible says. Let's get into our study. Question number one. To understand the subject of death, we've got to go back to the beginning and look at what happened when God first made man. How did we get here in the first place? It says in Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. You notice it does not say that God gave man or injected him with a soul. The combination of the breath of life and the dust of the earth that the Lord assembled, man then became a living soul. Don't miss that. When God first made Adam, and he put all the positions, the, the organs in their place, and there was blood in Adam's veins, but his heart was not beating, and he had a set of lungs, but they were not breathing. Then it says God breathed into him that breath of life. Question number two, what happens when a person dies? Basically, it's creation in reverse. You read in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, then the dust, the body, will return to the earth as it was. We know what happens when you die, you decompose. And it says, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So what is this spirit that returns to God at death? Is it a ghost that hops out of you? It says in Job, all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Well, I bet you never thought about it that way before. You got a soul up your nose, the spirit of God in your nostrils. What does that mean? It's the word there, spirit, is the Hebrew word roach, and it means the breath of God is in my nostrils. The word breath and spirit are interchangeable many times in the Bible. In Hebrew, it's roach. The word often translated spirit in Greek is pneuma, and so the word pneuma means breath. 
And so a lot of people have translated spirit, it's just the word breath, and I think it means a ghost jumps out of you. Again, the body without the spirit is dead. That word there, spirit, in James chapter 2, is breath. The body without the breath is dead. Everything breathes in our world. Even fish breathe. Mushrooms breathe. There is no life without breath. Every single cell of life in our world uses the gases of air somehow. They breathe or they die. So what is a soul then? The Bible talks about soul and everybody thinks it's a little butterfly ghost, some kind of pink cotton candy that comes out of you. Uh, it's this, you know, ethereal creature. Um, that's not what the Bible teaches. What is a soul? Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. We're going to review this. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a soul. The combination of the two things becomes a soul. Let's suppose for a moment here I've got a box, just a little wooden box. It's a combination of wood and nails. And I put the wood and the nails together and I make a box. Two components, wood and nails, box. So I now take my hammer and I pull out the nails and I set them over here and I take the little pieces of board, the wood, and I set them over here. I've still got the nails, I've still got the wood. Where's the box? The box stops being a box when you separate the two. That's the way it is with you being a soul. When you separate the breath of life from the body, it stops being a soul. Your soul experiences everything your soul experiences in your body. So the idea that you got a little ghost inside you that goes flitting around after you die, you don't find that in the Bible. Question. Big question. Do souls die? Can a soul die? Some people say, no, your soul's immortal. Let's find out what the Bible says. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, the soul that sins, can you see what that says? It shall what? The soul that sins, it shall die. The penalty for sin is death. Only the Lord has immortality. So you don't have an immortal soul. Matter of fact, you can read in Revelation 16, speaking about one of the plagues, it says, and every soul in the sea died. There the word soul is speaking about every living creature. And so when it says in Ecclesiastes, the body returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it, what is that spirit that returns to God? Every creature in the world gets its life from God. And when any creature dies, the life returns to God who gave it. It doesn't mean that it's up there having a conversation. The butterflies and the fish are all talking to each other. They all got these little ghosts. It's just talking about the power of life returns to God who gave it. And we read a lot of things and superstitions into the Bible. It's not there. Do good people go to heaven right when they die? Here's what the Bible says. Job 17, 3. If I wait, the grave is my house. They sleep a dreamless sleep in the grave. And again... Men and brethren, Peter speaking, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and that his tomb is with us to this day. Now, I'm speaking about good King David, you know, the one who killed Goliath. How many of you believe, if you know your Bible at all, that David will be saved? David's going to be saved. David died 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years before Christ. Good man, good king. Uh, here Peter is preaching right now at Pentecost a thousand years later. After the cross, after Jesus has ascended to heaven, and he said, let me tell you about King David, that he is dead and buried and his grave is still with us to this day. They could look and see where his grave was, right there outside Jerusalem. Still there today. I've been there. Reading on, Peter says, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Now I don't know how more clear the apostle can be when he says he's dead, he's buried, his grave is with us, and he's not in heaven. So, if good King David is not in heaven yet, and Jesus has had 3,000 years to get him there, then maybe we don't go there until a future time. Let's keep reading. When is that time? John chapter 5, these are the words of Jesus, verse 28. When the Lord comes back, it says, all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. There's a resurrection. How many of you knew there was a resurrection? People don't come out of their graves until the resurrection. That's the purpose of the resurrection. How much does one comprehend after death? I mean, don't you die and then at least you're in limbo or purgatory 
or Abraham's bosom. We've got all these places we've concocted where people kind of, it's a waiting room for heaven or hell. Uh, and the Bible doesn't teach that. Show me the word limbo in the Bible. Purgatory, where is that in the Bible? It's not there, is it? These are just man-made things. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, 10, uh, several places you can look. Do you believe the Bible, friends? Here's what it says. The dead know not anything. Couldn't be more clear than that. It's like a dictionary definition. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Under the sun means in this life. Once a person dies, they don't come back to haunt anybody. They don't know anything. They have nothing to do at all with anything that's going on in this world. Again, speaking of the dead, it says, His sons will come to honor, and he knows it not. They are brought low, and he perceives it not of them. In other words, when a person dies, they're not up in heaven looking down on their family. First of all, would you be very happy up in heaven if uh, you could look down and see all the trouble that your family's having and your, maybe your kids are going through? I mean, would you be enjoying the bliss of heaven when you see all the tragedy and misery on this world? It says the people in heaven have no more pain, no more sorrow. They're not going through all that agony of watch watching what's happening down here. They are sleeping a peaceful, dreamless sleep. Now some of them are thinking right now, Pastor Doug, what about that verse there in 1 Corinthians, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord? Well, that's absolutely true. If you're saved and you die, your next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. Jesus called unconsciousness, the unconscious state of the dead, sleep. In John 11, verse 11 to 14. How long will they sleep? It says, so man lies down and he rises not till the heavens be no more. Now we read this one to you a moment ago. When is it when the heavens are no more? The day of the Lord will come in which the heavens pass away. So they sleep until the heavens are no more. They sleep until the heavens pass away. That's when the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So it's at the coming of the Lord the dead will rise. They're not risen yet. As far as they're concerned, they have no consciousness of time. The resurrection happens as soon as they die because it's the next thing they know. But we live in time. Has it happened yet? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So everyone dies in Adam. We've all got these physical bodies. Adam died. God say, in the day you eat thereof, you will die. Adam began dying spiritually and even began dying physically the day that he sinned. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, here's the order. This is New Testament. When do they raise? Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ, what does it say? At his coming. When do they rise? We all die. But afterward, they that are Christ, at his coming, that's when they come back to life. If that's clear, say amen. amen. That's so clear to me. Jesus made it so clear. He said, our friend Lazarus is asleep. And then he later explained when the disciples said, well, good, he's sick, sleep, that'll be good for him. He said, no, no, Lazarus is dead. Jesus said, I'm speaking in symbolic terms. Lazarus is dead. Later he goes to the tomb to raise Lazarus. He'd been dead four days. And Martha wanted to, she said, Lord, it's not going to be pleasant. He said, roll away the stone. And she said, by this time there's a bad smell because he's been dead four days. You know, it's so, death is not a pretty thing. And he, she said, he's not going to smell. It's going to be awful, Lord. He said, roll away the stone. Trust me. And they rolled away the stone. It probably stunk when they did. But then Jesus said, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. All of a sudden, in the dark opening of that tomb, this figure came waddling out, bound up with these mummy-like cloths. And Jesus said, loose him. Lazarus was alive. Now, here's a question. A lot of the Christian world teaches today that when you die, you go right to heaven or hell, before the judgment, before the resurrection. Have you heard that? That is a false teaching. It doesn't matter how popular it is. It is unbiblical. And if nothing else, use your head. Think. There are about 12 resurrections in the Bible. If one person was resurrected in the world today, a bona fide resurrection, dead and buried four days, doctors declared them dead, 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 cold, lifeless, dead, no brain waves, 
buried him. Four days later, they open the grave, they stink, and all of a sudden they come back to life. Would you have every news agency in the world sending reporters, and they would be shoving microphones in their face and saying, what was it like on the other side? What did you see? What did you experience? Right? How come out of the 12 resurrections in the Bible, not one of them ever comments on what they experienced in death? Because they didn't experience anything. I mean, can you imagine what a dirty trick that would be? Here, Lazarus dies. He's up in heaven. He's with the angels. He's getting, reaching out for the tree of life. And all of a sudden, poof, he's back in grave clothes. And he says, thanks, Jesus. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd raise you because you're my friend. Bring you back. Give you your old body again. Would that have been, or, I mean, you know, if he was burning in hell and Jesus brought him back, you'd say, oh boy, it was hot, thanks a lot. <laughs> but he makes no comment at all about anything. Why? Because they knew back then the dead don't know anything. They're asleep. It's a dreamless, unconscious sleep. Doesn't matter how popular the other teachings are, they're not biblical friends. What happens to the righteous dead at the second coming of Jesus? It says in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Speaking of the trump when the Lord descends. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Speaking of the saved dead. They're the ones in the first resurrection. For this corruptible, this old body is not going to be there. It must put on incorruption, the glorified body. And this mortal, we're mortal now, will put on immortality. When do we get immortality? When the Lord comes. Our bodies aren't immortal yet. What was the devil's first lie? First lie that the devil told in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, you shall not surely die. God said, you eat the forbidden fruit and you'll die. There's two choices that God has given people. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, die, but have everlasting life. It's life or death. That's what salvation is all about. Life or death. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. See, the devil says you either live forever in hell or you live forever in heaven because you're immortal. The Bible doesn't teach that. We got life or death that we get to choose. The dragon said you'll not really die. You'll be transformed into a ghost or you'll be reincarnated. He's got all these other theories. That old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He's a serpent. That's what the dragon said to Eve. You don't really die. Does the devil still say that today? You know what's sad? The devil is saying it today through many pulpits around the world. That people don't really die. They turn into ghosts or spirits or angels or they're reincarnated or they channeled somewhere else in some other universe and uh, there's no limit to the theories. Number eight. Why did the devil lie to Eve about death? Could this subject be more important than many people think? And when they say unto you, seek those that have mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. People go to get a soothsayer. They go to get someone who will channel uh, an occultist, uh, a medium to call back the dead, to communicate. God says, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? God is saying, why are you trying to talk to the dead? And yet, the heart culture is just full of this. Some depart from the faith, Paul said, 1 Timothy 4.1, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A lot of people in our world, even in our churches, that have been seduced by spirits, they're deceived. And they say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I had this spirit tell me. And a lot of folks, and some who don't even believe in God, somehow believe in ghosts. You help me figure that out. They don't believe in God, but they believe the dead somehow can communicate. They believe in spiritism is what it is. Life after death. Science is searched for the meaning of near-death experiences. You've heard of near-death experiences. Sometimes they're called NDEs. Person dies on the um, operating table, ostensibly dies, supposedly they die. Their heart stops beating. And so the brain is not getting oxygen. And then they have this experience where they, they come out of their body and they, they then begin to hover above the operating table and they can kind of hear what's going on. And they're having all kinds of weird experiences. Some doctors did some research on this regarding carbon dioxide and out-of-body experiences, OBEs here. In one experiment, Dr. Lodisilis 
Maduna, administered 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen to a subject. Afterward, the subject stated, I felt as though I was looking down at myself, as though I was way out here in space. I felt sort of separated. Well, the guy didn't die. You show me someone gets their head cut off and comes back. I'll be impressed. That's not what happens. Their heart stops beating is typically what happens. Do devils really work miracles? It says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. And again, he says, I will go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Can devils perform signs and wonders and miracles? Can they deceive? It says, there will arise in the last days false Christs and false prophets. And they do what? They show great signs and wonders. Inasmuch that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. God is saying, look, I've told you beforehand. So why do we need to understand this subject in the last days? Because the devil is going to use the misunderstanding about death to deceive many people. By thy sorceries, Revelation 18, 23, were all nations deceived. I heard a story about um, a woman who was, I think, living in San Francisco at the time during the Vietnam War. She had a son over there. Son was not a Christian, anything but. And then one day she got a very tragic note in the mail. It said, uh, when she opened it up, she started to shake because she knew it was from the State Department. It said, um, we regret to inform you that your son is missing in action and presumed dead. Uh, she was just totally devastated, her only son, and it really hurt her because she was a good Christian, and by all outward exp experience, it seemed like he had died lost. And then one day, while she was in her bedroom weeping, all of a sudden, her son appeared. And he was there, and he said, Mom, and he's in this glowing robe. He said, you, I've seen you. I've been watching you. You're crying over me, and you don't need to cry anymore. He said, I'm okay. And so she didn't know what to think. She said, son, she went to lunge for him and hug him. She said, you can't touch me. He said, but I want you to know that you don't need to worry. But you weren't a Christian. She said, God is merciful. He saves everybody. And she said, well, but that's not what the Bible says. Well, these warnings are in the Bible to encourage people to live right. But God is merciful. Nobody's going to hell. No one will be lost. And he began to tell her all these things that were contradicting the Bible. And she was so confused. And he appeared to her several times. And it made her feel good to see him. It gave her comfort to see this apparition, but it was so, and she was a leader in her church. She didn't know what to do. And then one day she heard a knock at the door, and she opened the door, and there's her son again. He said, now he's in a uniform, and his arm is in a sling. And she said, why are you appearing at the door? And why are you wearing this uniform? And he said, Mom, what are you talking about? Aren't you glad to see me? It was her real son. <laughs> he wasn't really dead. Evidently, the, the devils got their computer software crashed or something. They messed up, and they started impersonating her son that wasn't really dead. <laughs> she saw something, but it wasn't her son. And he had been working on her to deceive her about what the Bible really said, eroding the teachings of the Bible. Are you thankful for the Bible truth that teaches us the truth on this sensitive subject of death? You know, I'm so glad you can say with... Um, Apostle Paul, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Jesus said, I am he that lives. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And he's got the keys of death and hell. We're finishing where we started. He's got those keys of life, and he's offering them to you and me. That's good news, friends. Nobody's up there haunting you. People don't get their, their rewards until the Lord comes back. The Bible says that because Jesus rose again, we can rise again. He is the resurrection and the life. If you've got Jesus, you've got life. Welcome again to the Landmarks of Prophecy Bible Study Series. And tonight we're going to be studying a subject that you do find in the prophecies of the Bible, dealing with the kingdom of heaven. More specifically, the lesson tonight is titled The Magnificent Kingdom. And it's based upon a story that you find in your Bible uh, with the experience of King Solomon. Now, when you look at the history of Israel, they had their ups and downs. But if you were to pick a point during the history of Israel when they had the highest glory, it would be during the time of King Solomon, in particular, when the Queen of Sheba came. 
because it tells us that the goal that God had for his people, he said, I want you to be a nation of kings and priests. I want all people to come to you and to learn of me. I, the temple had just been built. Everything was brand spanky new. Solomon had just built his house. There was great wealth and prosperity. They had peace on all their borders. And during that time, the Queen of Sheba had heard about the wisdom of Solomon. She came from a very wealthy country down somewhere near Saudi Arabia with a great caravan brought animals and gifts and all these treasures to Solomon and all she was asking for she said I want to ask you questions because the most important thing to her was truth and wisdom she purely wanted to see what who was the God that Solomon worshiped you ever heard the ex the expression uh, I had a breathtaking experience that comes from the Queen of Sheba after she saw Solomon's house and the temple of God and the seating of his servants in their apparel and the wealth of the kingdom and heard his answers for all the questions the Bible says there was no more spirit left in her we learned what that word means she was left breathless that's what the word spirit means there she was left it was breathtaking and she said surely the half was not told me of your wisdom and your greatness and so in this story we sort of have an allegory of the glorious, magnificent kingdom that God is preparing for us. I want you to listen to this lesson tonight. Use a little faith that think bigger than just the here and the now. Bible has a lot to say about heaven and it's very real. Let's look at some of the verses. Question number one in our lesson. What did Jesus promise his people? What did Jesus promise his people? In John 14 verse two, he said, in my Father's house, and you can say it with me, are many mansions. I go to prepare a pl place for you. And he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Hebrews 11, verse 16, the Bible says, for he has prepared for them, what? A city. Now, when I think of cities, I don't, think usually good things. You know why? People struggle with sin and selfishness. And wherever you have a concentration of people, you're gonna have a concentration of problems. Where do you have the gang problems? Not so much out on the farm, it's in the cities where you've got the concentration of people. And cities in heaven will be different because there's no sin problem, there's no selfishness. Instead of it being a concentration of selfish people, it'll be a concentration of loving people. It'll be a great thing there. So I had to kind of revise my thinking about cities when I read that God has prepared a city because I used to run the other direction when I thought about cities. Revelation 21, verse two. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Now here's a picture of the old Jerusalem. And uh, you know, the city that's probably had more wars fought that has been destroyed and rebuilt more than any other city in the world is a city called the City of Peace. You know, that's what Jerusalem means. Jeru, city, shalom, peace. Jeru, shalom, city of peace. It's first mentioned in the Bible with a king. The first king of Jerusalem is not David or Saul or Solomon. It's someone named Melchizedek who the New Testament tells us is a type of Christ. He was a king of righteousness. He brought out bread and wine for Abraham. Jesus is our king of righteousness. He was called the priest of the most high God. Jesus is our king, he's our priest, he's our king of righteousness. He brings us the bread and the wine. That's in the Last Supper. And Melchizedek was the king of a place called Salem or peace. Probably was peaceful back then. But once they started building up the city, there were more, wa you walk around the old Jerusalem today and you can see bullet holes in the walls and the buildings still everywhere that have not been repaired. Just little chip pit marks from the wars that have been fought. But it's not the old Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven. And some people say, oh, Doug, you know, how can you take this seriously? Pie in the sky by and by. These stories about heaven, you Christians need to, it's just a crutch for your, your weakness. You need to live in the here and now. You know, but those same people have no problem believing that man can make a space city. Isn't that strange? Does anyone now doubt that we could put at least a little city in space? Isn't that what we have with the International Space Station? 
So the world laughs when we talk about heaven. But you know, God takes it very seriously. God doesn't blink or flinch when he talks about heaven. He said it's real. So when God says, I'm going to bring this city down from heaven, these dwelling places, people watch Star Trek and they think, oh, it could be true. You know, all these Trekkies out there, they'll believe it. But God says it and so, oh, not so sure God can do it. Hollywood can do it, but we're not sure about God. I think he can. What more do we know about the holy city? We're going to look at a number of details that tell us about heaven and what's going to be happening there. Revelation 21, verse 10 and verse 12, it says, The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God had a wall great and high and had what? Twelve gates. Now, 12 is a perfect mathematical number, really, for building. Why do we have a foot with 12 inches? Because it's one of the most perfectly easily divisible numbers. 12 is divisible by 1, by 2, by 3, by 4, by 6. And uh, God, in building the city, used perfect arithmetic. 12 is a number that represents the church. There are a lot of unusual numbers. How many tribes of Israel? 12. How many apostles? 12. 12. And Bible tells us that the New Jerusalem has 12 foundations, 12 gates. And you know what it says the gates are made of? You've heard the expression pearly gates? Doesn't mean that they're inlaid with mother of pearl. The Bible says that each gate is a pearl. Now, when you look at the dimensions of this city, if one wall is 375 miles, and it says the walls are 144 cubits or over 200 feet thick. Not quite sure how high they are. There's one verse that says the length, the breadth, and the height are the same. One of the gates would need to be pretty big. That'd be a pretty big pearl. You think, Pastor Doug, I can't imagine that. Don't worry, the Bible says you can't imagine the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So as we go through this study and say, oh, that's too far-fetched, I can't imagine that, that's exactly what Jesus said. You can't even imagine it. And if the pearls are that big, think about how big the oysters have to be <laughs> in heaven, right? And then you can read in uh, Revelation 21, 21. The street of the city was pure gold. Now, I've heard that gold, if, it was, if they could make gold absolutely pure, it would be transparent. That what gives gold the color is the varying degrees of impurity. And about 14 carat is about as pure as we can get it. But, um, and then, you know, I got 22 carat and various forms of gold. But here, John is saying this gold is, it's as if it's transparent. It is the purest form of gold in heaven. What does the Bible say about the city's water supply and its food supply? I get so excited talking about this, this study. It says in Revelation 22, verse 1, He showed me a pure river of water of life. All life needs water. Animal, plant, fungus, mushrooms, bugs, whatever it is, there is no life. Bacteria cannot live without water. And in this world, the source of all life is going to be this water. Jesus said, I am the water of life. And first we must accept that into our lives. But from the throne of God flows this river. Now I've seen the Nile, I've seen the Amazon, and the Mississippi, and a number of the, the major rivers of the world. And do you know, at its mouth, the Amazon River is like a 50, 100 miles wide where it enters the Atlantic Ocean. How big do you think this river is? When you picture the river that irrigates the whole planet as the main river that's supplying the water to the planet, you better think big. It is going to be enormous. Furthermore, on either side, Revelation 22, verse 2, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bear 12 different kinds of fruit. It yields her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is a tree that every person alive on the planet needs to eat from. All the saved need to eat from this tree. And I think it, the branches not only grow together above the, tree, above the river, I think the roots may touch under the river, and the river actually runs through it because it's one tree on either side of the river. How else do you, and they've looked at this in every translation, it says the same thing. One tree on either side of the river. River runs right through it. It's a massive, massive organism. 
and we'll all gather. It says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. So what's that mean? Are people going to get sick in heaven, have to run to the tree and rub it in their wounds? No, there's no sickness there. It doesn't say the leaves of the tree are for the healing of sickness. It says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. You know, we're all divided in this world by political divisions, cultural, racial, language divisions. But when we come together as one family under the glittering leaves of that tree, all the divisions and distinctions are going to be healed and there's going to be a unity there as we all have to reach out together and take from that tree of life. How will the living in heaven be different from here on earth? All right, we're going to go through several things that are very exciting. A, and these are kind of A, B, C. Answer A, the eyes of the, the blind will be open. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Some people maybe who have never seen, they're all going to have perfect vision then. You'll be able to see like an eagle. See, anything you've got in this life is going to be maximized in heaven. All your senses will be infinitely more acute. And I think that they'll actually be enhanced. People who've always struggled with eyesight here are going to have the best eyesight there. People maybe who have struggled with hearing here, it says the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And uh, it says in Isaiah 35, verse 6, answer C, then shall the lame man leap as a heart, not just walk a little bit. You remember when Peter and John healed this crippled man at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3. It says he went into the temple of God jumping and leaping and praising God. He went from being crippled to leaping. And he was so excited. All of your senses, all these things will be, and then it says, and the tongue of the dumb will not just talk, but they will sing. And they'll have beautiful voices. And I'll be able to sing. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Answer D, Isaiah 65, verse 25. And all the creatures there, there'll be animals there. How many more were there before the problems of man and before the flood? There'll be many more varieties. And will they hurt each other? No. You want to hear an amazing fact? See, you ever, <laughs> you've heard of uh, the Wizard of Oz, and they sing, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Well, these three in this picture here, they call them BLT. BLT stands for bear, lion, and tiger. <laughs> they were rescued from a drug dealer in Atlanta, kept them as cubs in his basement. It was a filthy conditions. They were rescued. They were adopted by an animal park in Georgia because they were so used to being with each other. They put them in the same enclosure, and they all get along just great. You ever wondered what would happen if a lion and a tiger and a bear got together? Well, if they know each other from childhood, they can do okay. And that's why the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter, uh, this is answer E in your lesson, Isaiah 11 verse 6, the wolf will dwell with the lamb and a little child will lead them. You can see a little child leading a lamb, but a little child leading a lamb and a wolf. And it says that the lion will eat straw like the ox. How many of you ever read that book? It was out years ago about little tyke. And you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hands. Little tyke. This family had a... Um, adopted a baby cub. Its mother actually was killing all of her cubs and so they took it away from the mother at the zoo. They gave it to this family, the West Falls in uh, Northern California and they, they adopted it and they gave it milk and once it got past milk they tried to give it meat. It would not eat meat but it gravitated towards grain and this lion just refused to eat meat. It would play with lambs and the family pets and would never bite or hurt anything else on the farm. And it never, its entire group to be a f massive full-grown lion, never ate any blood, any meat. It was a vegetarian lion. <laughs> How many of you heard that story? You can look it up. Little Tyke is the name of the book. It's an amazing story. Answer F. It says, the desert shall blossom like the rose. You can find the most uh, desolate places in the world now and there'll be a beautiful garden there. You know, now we have places that are just, they look like they're scorched earth, but not in heaven. The beautiful places will be infinitely more beautiful and the deserts will still be beautiful. But uh, the colors that you see now are nothing compared to the colors. If we could be taken in vision right now to heaven, if we could endure it, if we could handle the glory of it all and how spectacular it is, if you could hear the strains of angels singing, if you could taste how much better, infinitely more um, delicious the food is going to be, whatever your senses are, multiply that a hundred times. Everything has become dull in this life because of sin. 
it's all going to be enhanced and it will be that way for eternity. Furthermore, answer G, Isaiah 33, verse 24, the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. Nobody will be sick there. Won't that be wonderful? Don't have to ever worry about your health plan in heaven or your health insurance. Answer H, Revelation 21, verse 4, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. What you get there, you get forever, and you never have to be afraid of losing it again. And yet, people are they're re reluctant. They hesitate being willing to give their hearts to Jesus and to follow him. Number six, what kind of bodies will the saints have in the kingdom? Are we going to be ghosts floating around? Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. The Lord is going to give us a glorious body. When Jesus rose from the dead, was he real? You remember? He came forth from the grave. He appeared to the disciples. And there in the upper room, he told them, Luke 24, verse 39, he said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. What is he saying? He's saying, I am not a ghost. And then he ate in front of them to prove that he was real. What kind of bodies will we have? Real bodies. But we get four dimensions. See, right now we live in three dimensions. After Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the whole dimension, the spiritual dimension. That will be restored, and we will have these glorified, eternal bodies. We'll be able to talk to the angels. We'll see God so we'll be in tune with the spirit world at that point, the good spirits, <laughs> the angels. What other encouraging promises are found in God's word regarding this magnificent kingdom? It says in Acts chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, and he will send Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. That means everything is going to be restored. Now here's a question, friends. How many of you want to be in that kingdom and follow Jesus there then? If you're going to follow him there then, you must first follow him here now. That's it. Those that follow him here now will be able to follow him there then. You can't make up your mind at the last moment you want to be a Christian after probation closes. God's calling you now. Will sad or painful memories from this life trouble people in heaven? Answer, Isaiah 65, verse 17, it says, the former things will not be remembered nor come into mind. We won't have to worry about the form. I don't know about you. Even while I'm standing here, I can think of things that I just, whenever I think of, I just cringe and go, oh, did I say that? Did I do that? Oh, or painful things you've experienced you wish you could forget. Some people have experienced violence and, and things that just have caused all kinds of stress, soldiers. And you think, well, I have those terrible memories forever. God says, he'll heal us. All the beauty and the glory and the splendor and the wonder and the pleasures of heaven will eclipse and displace all the painful memories of this life. And there'll be pleasures at his right hand forevermore. What other thrilling promises does God give us regarding his coming kingdom? A number of things here we're going to look at. Answer A. In Isaiah 35, verse 10, it says, The ransomed of the Lord shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy. God is a loving heavenly Father, and the Bible says he will withhold no good thing, no good thing from those that walk uprightly. He will not want to keep anything good from you. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore, but you'll never find the pleasure unless you do it God's way. Oh, by the way, uh, I just jumped ahead to our next verse. This is my wife's favorite verse. Psalm 16, verse 11. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Pleasure is not a bad thing. God wants you to enjoy pleasure. He gave you all the senses. He wants you to be blessed by your food. But you know, in, in the world, we spin it around backwards. We think we're supposed to go for the physical selfish pleasures first, and then we suffer with the hangover all day. Answer C, Zechariah 8, 5. 
The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. You know, here in some of our cities, we we're pretty scared. My mother used to let my brother and I play on 42nd and Broadway. It's hard to believe now. But in heaven, will there be anything to be afraid of? You'll tell your children, go play in the street. Go play in the golden streets. <laughs> they have nothing to be afraid of out there, right? No one's going to hurt them. Answer D. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. They'll mount up with wings like it. Will be be able to fly? Yeah. Talks about, you know that song, Rock of Ages? I'll soar to worlds unknown. Of course, that's a song. But I believe, it says we'll mount up with wings like eagles. I believe we'll be able to fly. What is the highest reward of God's new kingdom? Oh, this is the most beautiful part. It tells us in Revelation 21, verse 3, God himself will be with them. Want to be something? The Bible says that from one new moon to another and one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. We'll be able to worship before Jesus. He'll be the preacher and nobody will fall asleep during the sermon when he's preaching, right? And we'll know that uh, everything he says is good and true. God himself will be with them. We'll see him. What will exclude people from God's heavenly kingdom? And this is where it gets serious. Revelation 21, verse 27. There shall in no wise, that means in no way, enter into it anything that defiles. That means that if there's anything defiling or sinful, it doesn't go in. The Bible says that Satan was cast out of heaven for sinning. Heaven is a pure place. It's the presence of God. We must be purified now and prepared through the blood of Christ to live in that kingdom. So we can't wait till Jesus comes for him to transform us. Now is the time for us to become new creatures. The Bible says that today is the day. The Lord can give you a new heart. Old things are passed away when you're converted. All things are made new. Uh, it's often called the new birth. And we need to be born again now. Revelation 21, 7. He that, he that overcometh. That's the King James way of saying he that overcomes. Seven times it says in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Overcoming what? We're all held captive by our sins and through the power of Christ we can be transformed and be new creatures. It is possible. All things can happen through prayer. You spend time with Jesus you fix your eyes on Jesus, you think about these things and it starts to become part of you. What did Jesus say is the formula for success in this life and in the life to come? Matthew chapter 6, 33, you know this, it's where we started. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. Solomon, when he loved the Lord, he prayed, Lord, give me wisdom. He prayed for God's kingdom. He prayed for God's righteousness. God said, because you sought this first, I'm going to give you everything else. I'm going to give you the wisdom. I'll give you long life. I'll give you prosperity. But seek first my kingdom. And that was the key. And it's still the key today. If you make God, knowing God and sharing God, living for him, living for others, your priority, he's offering you that wonderful kingdom.